again welcome back to today's reading corner today i picked an essay and it is called the unfinished malik pancholi pilot by malik pancholi which i happen to learn he actually went to high school in tampa he went to berkeley prep he was born in ohio but he he grew up in tampa and also i discovered that you guys may know him as the voice of sanjay from sanjay and craig but he is the voice of my favorite animated character, Baljeet, from Phineas and Ferb. So let's listen up and see what he has to say. Fade in. Good Samaritan Hospital, January 18th, 1974. The camera hovers high up in the sky, looking over the moonlit town of Dayton, Ohio. Suddenly we hear a baby cry, like really cry, like an, oh my God, I just got born, what's happening, kind of cry. Our camera flies down from the sky and through the roof of the hospital, races along the halls, and lands on baby Malik, Malik craning his tiny little neck to look at all the other babies in the nursery. Baby Malik, in his mind, obviously, he's just a baby. Whoa, wait a minute, am I the only Indian baby in here? He rolls his head to the other side. It's not easy. I mean, he doesn't even have fully developed neck muscles yet. Baby Malik continued, still in his mind. This is reality after all, people. Oh, wait, is that? Nope, she's not Indian either. Hold the phone, why does nobody look like me? Ominous footsteps. Nurse Freddy's enormous face pops into frame, a tangled wasp's nest of blonde hair and spider webs of mascara surrounding her eyes. Baby Malik, frantic. What, what, what do you want? Who are you? Nurse Freddy, I think you know what I want. Baby Malik, how did you hear me? I don't even know how to talk out loud yet. Nurse Freddy, ignoring him. Do you know what happens down here to little babies who are different? Sing-songy and menacing. One of these things is not like the others. She lets out an evil laugh and starts to reach for him. Baby Malik, scrunching up his little baby face. What the what, lady? Nurse Freddy, oh, I'll show you what the what. Baby Malik, sarcastic. Uh, yeah, okay, real original. Way to say exactly what I just said right back to me. Is that all you got? Nurse Freddy, thrown. What? Baby Malik, you're going to have to do better than that, nurse lady. Baby Malik balls up his little baby fist and starts punching the air like a madman. Baby Malik continued. Nobody puts Baby Malik in the corner. Okay, okay, okay. That's not exactly how the first day of my life went, but there are parts of it that aren't totally off base. I was born in Dayton, Ohio in 1974. In the 1970s, there were fewer than 20,000 Asian American people in the entire state of Ohio. You can Google it. That's not a lot of Asian American people, which means even fewer Indian American people. So there weren't a lot of other babies who looked like me. So maybe I wasn't battling evil nurses, but I did have a sense very early on that I was different. That wasn't limited to just my skin color. I used to write my fours backward. When my parents would try to correct me, I'd say, well, that's my four, and that's your four. So I guess I was kind of sassy. I was also really scrawny. When I was five, I had to take all these tests to figure out why I was so little. A doctor had me run up and down stairs, jump on boxes, and do sor all sorts of physical challenges. Turned out, everything was fine. Take that staircase. But I wouldn't catch up to the other kids for a few years. So instead of playing sports, I wanted to tap dance which wasn't exactly considered cool at the time. Things like math came pretty easy to me, so I was definitely a nerd at school. And I loved acting. I loved make-believe and playing characters. My cousins and I would put on shows for our parents at family gatherings <laughs> and charge them admission. Cartoons, television shows, movies, and plays mesmerized me. I loved storytelling, acting. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted it so badly that I told my parents in between correcting their very weird fours, when I was only five years old that I was going to be an actor. That seemed perfectly reasonable. Do what you love. But the thing is, I never saw anyone who looked like me on TV or in the movies. All my favorite cartoon characters, Super Friends, Scooby-Doo, well, they were either white or, well, dogs. There were virtually no brown people on television shows we watched, or the shows that my parents tried to keep us from watching, like Dallas and Falcon Crest. And the occasional Indian person who popped up in a film was laughable, stereotypical, and often played by a white actor in brown face. Short circuit, anyone? So what kind of career was I going to have? You might call that lack of representation subtle messaging that brown people don't belong. That's our stories not worth telling, and we're not actually a part of the fabric of American culture. 
Other times, the message was not so subtle. I remember my mom getting rear-ended when I was a teenager. It was clearly the other driver's fault, but as my mom got out of the car, he yelled, You're not even from here! Why don't you just go back to your own country? I remember sitting in the car, anger coursing through my veins, but also fear. Someone was trying to intimidate us because we were Indian. The same feeling of fear crept in when I realized I was gay. Not only was it terrifying to think that the people I cared about might not accept me, but there was also the glaring fact that there were hardly any gay characters on television, let alone openly gay actors. Did this mean I would have to live a life of hiding in order to be successful? In the beginning, I did hide. I tried to be just like everyone else. When I was in college, it was pretty easy to forget that I wasn't white. I was immersed in an excellent theater program where we studied great playwrights like Ibsen, Chekhov, Brecht, and Shakespeare. All amazing, but for the most part, all white. Theirs were the parts I got to play in class, and I just assumed that meant I'd get to play any parts I wanted to when I graduated. When I moved to Los Angeles shortly after college, however, I realized that I couldn't actually hide being brown. The parts I thought would be open to me were in fact reserved for actors who were, well, not brown. I was thrilled when I landed my first guest starring role on a television show, but horrified that I'd be playing a foreign exchange student who wore a turban, ate camel nuggets, spoke in a heavy accent, and was basically the butt of every joke. That wasn't what I had imagined when I said I wanted to be an actor. Around this time, I also started to come to terms with my sexuality. While I began to talk to friends and family, I was still terrified about what this would mean in the entertainment industry. But I also knew that there had to be more of a life, more to life than running away from myself and playing degrading roles. Somewhere inside me was, after all, that kid who was so certain of himself, who knew a backward four was his four. I wasn't going to give up. I continued taking classes, showing up to auditions, and working to be the best actor I could be. I got accepted to the Yale School of Drama, and it was there that I started to profoundly understand that being an actor meant being willing to let my true self be a part of my work. Shortly after school, I started to land roles that were fulfilling. On the Showtime series Weeds, I played Sanjay, a college tutor and drug dealer who came out as gay. He was both Indian American and a three-dimensional character, and I think it meant a great deal to Asian Americans and to LGBTQ Asian Americans to be represented on TV. On NBC's 30 Rock, I played executive assistant Jonathan. I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with comedy heavyweights Alec Baldwin and Tina Fey. This time, we weren't really concerned with the character's race. Rather, the show, the show explored the relationship between an executive assistant and his boss. Being able to do this on television, getting to show that brown people are an integral part of American culture and not just a joke, and that the LGBTQ characters can be represented in meaningful ways made me want to do more. Being a public figure gave me a platform. I started to speak at various Asian American and LGBTQ nonprofit organizations. I traveled to universities to address students about why we need diversity in the media. I learned that there was a great power not only in telling stories on television, but also in sharing my own story with others. In 2014, this led to President Obama appointing me to the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. During my time at the White House, I helped create an anti-bullying campaign geared towards Asian American and Pacific Islander kids called Act to Change, which I continue to lead today. No one should feel that their differences make them less than. The battle is far from over. I was the voice of Sanjay for Nickelodeon cartoons Sanjay and Craig. I think of myself watching cartoons on weekend mornings and longing to see a character that looked like me. Now I've given that to other kids. Sanjay was half Indian and half Caucasian, and just a regular kid who loved getting into gross stuff and going on crazy adventures. So many biracial and Asian American kids wrote to say how meaningful the character was to them. But there was also a writer who said in an interview that the show was awkward because there's actually no reason for that character to be Indian. He asked, why make him Indian? He just didn't get it, so the fight goes on. And the fight is big. There are a lot of people out there right now screaming, go back to your own country. Just like that guy yelled at my mom and me so many years ago. So I use acting and entertainment and also social work and politics to keep pushing back. This is my country. For me, our strongest weapon is to keep telling our stories. Which reminds me, I need, get, I need to get back to the unfinished Malik Pencholi pilot. That opening scene needs work. Scary nurses, talking babies, really? I do have an idea for the ending, though. I'm thinking, adult Malik. Nevertheless, I persisted.